So in this video, I'm going to give you reasons why banking, even international banking, any bank, is uh, on my bad list. And this is something that has uh, been going on now for quite some time that is cumulative. So it's not like the latest thing. It's something that's been going on little by little. It's just like little clues that you're getting that things just weren't right. And then 2020 hit and bam. And it's like, yup, confirmation, right? Hey, hey, welcome back to Frank and Angie's Retire Early Lifestyle. Our premise is that our life should be something we don't need to vacate from. Just no need to take a vacation from an already extraordinary life exactly the way you want it. And today I've got a few whoppers for you. We're back at the beach though first. I know some of you missed our beach videos and the weather wasn't cooperating, but today is just a splendid day, the kind of day that makes you want to just think about coming here more often. <laughs> weather permitting, of course. Banks are a business just like any other business. So banks are a business, right? And so they're supposedly a business thrives when it serves the needs of its customers except for bank businesses seem to be a little bit apart from that. They don't seem to... <laughs> I don't know, the, the times have changed. It's like in, back in the day, you, you know, I, I had a relationship with bankers and uh, they were service oriented. They wanted to help you with your business and this kind of thing. And you tell me in the comments if, if you think this and, and if this is your experience even in USA. But anymore, the foreign banks don't seem to, and I could sit here and give you at least half a dozen stories about just as many banks and just as many different jurisdictions abroad. So it isn't something that's particular to any particular location so you can't really say oh you know oh banks in Ecuador oh forget it which you could definitely say that <laughs> but that's not what what I'm talking about even though you could say that uh, and act we actually said such a thing years ago when we first went to Ecuador it's it's still the case they you know it's just all of these banks one way or another they just seem to put their own interests above the interest of the customer. You don't feel like you're really patronizing a business. Like if you go into Pizza Hut, their goal is to bring you a good pizza, a pizza you'll enjoy, you know, a, uh, a pizza that you feel you got a good value. And if anything was wrong, why, you know, they wanted feedback, they wanted to serve you. And, and more and more of these banks are like, no, this is the rule. And if you don't like it, you can just take a hike, <laughs> you know. <laughs> The other reason is I just saw uh, this morning I was uh, looking at, and I won't tell you the whole story. I don't want to drag it on. And but there was a reason why the banks they they were the narrator in the video was saying that because of a crime and because of certain things that were happening with crime, and I'm not sure how much detail I should go into. But the point was that they were going to they were advocating using the banks as a oh, sort of a, a policing entity. My point here is that people losing control of making their own decisions you know over their own money and you know for one reason or another whether it's because of oh it's a policy or uh, no we don't do it that way you know I had a bank say to me just a year ago they were trying to tell me that I had to access my account a certain way and that was the only way that I could do it and I said no, I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, you have to, you have to. And I said, no, I don't. You can't lock me out of my own money. And I just was per persistent. And I complained and I complained. And eventually they dropped it. So banks have taken over the years, and especially even more so recently, as time comes, we're seeing more and more of this where banks take it upon themselves to become dictators in the way that in the way that they remove your ability to make your own decisions over your own money. And it used to be, back in the day, 
they were just another business and they were there to serve you. But anymore, it seems like they're just making policies, rules, regulations, and, and this and that, and they end up removing your ability to make your own choices, which is a loss of freedom. And, uh, you know, this day and age, when we come to a position where we, well, we have been relying on banks in order to live our lives, but things are changing, and we'll get to that in a different video. I'm just telling you here that there was four different reactions that different people can, can have. Like when a bank says, no, you can't access your account unless you do it this way, and I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do it that way. And they insist, and I insist, and I just, just it's a game of wills where I don't back down. And eventually, they back down. So you've got four different reactions that people can react to these kinds of things. Well, the first person might say, yeah, what's the problem? Just do it, you know, it's for the good of all or whatever. And the second person might say, well, I don't think this is right. They shouldn't be doing this. But in order to avoid conflict, they're going to go, go ahead with it and go along, but they won't say anything. The third person, you know, will protest the whole time and the whole way. I mean, they will just protest and protest. They will just complain and they will just put up a, a fight and they will just say, this is wrong. You can't be doing this. This is my money, but they'll still uh, go along. And the fourth person will simply say, look, I'm not gonna go along with this. And you know, either the, the bank's gonna back down or I'm just going to not do business with you anymore. So those are the four different reactions we can have to the kind of thing that we're seeing come about around us now. And the thing is that we have way more options than we ever have had before. And those options are under attack. But I believe they will survive because there's still useful and usable options out there that we didn't have before. When you have your own Bitcoin wallet, nobody tells you you can't access your wallet. Nobody tells you you have to access your wallet like this. You can only access your wallet this way. Nobody can tell you that because it's yours. Just like when a wallet with cash money in it is in your pocket, it's your in your possession. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. So it's in your possession. Nobody can tell you you can't grab your wallet, grab a $10 bill, and buy a coffee or whatever. Nobody can tell you that. But there are people that want to tell you that. They want to be able to tell you, no, you can't access your own wallet. You can't access your own money. We're gonna tell you how you can access it, when you can access it, and what you can do with it. There are people that think it's their job to do such a thing. And one out of four people is likely to agree with that, which leaves about three fourths. So, you know, we are a majority. <laughs> we just need to be heard. So, but apparently there was some news out that nowadays the banks are only going to allow people like a certain number of uh, withdrawals or transfers from their accounts. And uh, so the banks had transfer limits on them. And the funny thing about that is that when you go abroad, a lot of these banks, at least uh, the American banks, do allow a certain amount of transfer, but the, some of these, a lot of these foreign banks won't even allow you, and especially in Ecuador, to make any transfers on your computer or online uh, or anything, and so that you constantly have to go in the bank just to do anything that you're so used to doing. And so the point was that the banks have their own reasons why they have these transfer limits, that they only let you do so many transfers on your account. And that's the whole point, is that it's like 
well, it's our reasons, not your reasons, and what you know, it's we make those rules, and that's that. It's like over a period of time, we lose control or access little by little. It's the principle of, and I'm not sure if it's a principle, but it's like incrementalism. It's like a tool that can be used to take people off guard to slowly, little by little, get them into a corner where they're trapped. I thought that was important enough to spend a little more time on. Moving on, so I've been talking about PayPal CEO quitting and all these people that quit just before it hits the fan for them. And it seems really opportunistic that just as I was saying that in the other video the other day, YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki, Wojcicki resigns a day after subpoenas were issued to big tech CEO, so that's day after. Now sometimes they seem to precede these things where they resign a week or two before they actually happen or even a month or two. Very opportunistic timing on some of these resignations. So there's always hope that things will change. And I know a lot of people have been saying that this channel should be getting more views and more subscribers. And we agree with you. <laughs> Apparently, the numbers are saying that inflation in the U.S. in January was higher than expected. It's like when inflation is higher, the Fed is tasked with trying to get it to go lower and therefore going to raise interest rates. And I was reading that the price of homes has like crashed, I mean, 35% in San Francisco. And they have crashed faster than they did in the 2008 crash. Which is, which is, well, that looks nice, which is significant. And you don't hear much about that in the news, I guess. I mean, over 50,000 people have left San Francisco, okay, since 2021. And so there's no cause for alarm unless you're in San Francisco. But prices had shot up so much and so quickly, I mean, to the ridiculous, that people are even leaving Silicon Valley. So. These kinds of things, when they go up so exponentially and so much, I mean, I could just see somebody getting control of just a couple of houses and becoming semi-wealthy in a jiffy, <laughs> you know, just for with California real estate. Matter of fact, you see uh, a few of these people that are even on YouTube blogging now. We retired under Californians, you know, and we retired early abroad and this kind of thing. And a lot of that was through the real estate. And if you were Jack B. Nimble and you got out quick enough before this crash, everything's okay. But a 35% crash in real estate is, um, is pretty alarming. And uh, although things, when I talk to uh, different real estate agents, because I keep track of the real estate industry, because I, uh, I do real estate investments, uh, a lot of them are telling me that Things are still selling quite quickly in a lot of places and they're still getting a lot of multiple offers. But, you know, this is just the beginning. I mean, this is like the first year. It's like the first year of a recession. And the literature says that the very first year of the 2008 recession of real estate only went down like 25, uh, 25 30 percent also and then it just the following year or two it still kept going down so it can be just the beginning i'm sure that a lot of these places are actually experiencing a boom and there's been so much displacement in the last couple of years that it has caused these mini booms and whenever something goes up way too fast it just sets it up for a crash at some time in the future I would be very careful. A lot of uh, people that are trying to sell a real estate right now are still trying to get yesterday's prices, and there's a lot of them are still kind of getting that in a lot of places. But uh, I recall when the very big recession in the 80s, I was also at that time in the real estate market. I noticed that the real estate appears to have a little bit more of a gradual decline over a period of a couple of years as opposed to say a stock that can tank overnight 
Coinbase issued a statement saying that uh, they, they pointed out that the, the core uses of these stable coins are said that they find immense uses, listen to the language, in circumventing the inefficiencies in the traditional banking world. That's an, an amazing statement and uh, that makes so much sense. It, it's just undeniable how much sense that makes.